Hello, everyone. How y'all doing? All right, good. I want to go ahead and uh, find your seats, uh, get comfortable. We're going to be uh, getting a talk from Jake Vanderplas. He is a astronomer, which I'm deeply jealous of. Uh, probably more germane for this in particular, though. He's uh, deeply involved in the uh, scientific Python community and is one of the core developers for my favorite toy, uh, Scikit-Learn. So, Jake. All right. All right, thanks. It's good to be here. Um, so I, I work a lot on scientific Python, and I work on um, kind of data-intensive science with Python. My background is in astronomy, so I, I do a bit of that. And one of the, the key tools that we use in astronomy for numerical computing, and in all of science, actually, is this library NumPy, which you're probably familiar with. If you're not, it's something you should be familiar with. And um, what I want to do today is talk about how to use NumPy effectively to do data-intensive computing. And um, there's a couple ways. It's, it's relatively easy to use, but there's some different ways that you need to think about writing your code when you're using NumPy in order to, to use it effectively. So I'm going to go through a few of those strategies. So um, I hope that background is OK. There's not too much green background. Sorry about that. So um, I, I want to start out with saying Python is fast. This is why we use Python, right? For writing, testing, and developing code, Python is incredibly fast. And one of my favorite examples is I like to put up hel Hello World in Python, right? You just print Hello World. It is great. And if any of you have been in other languages, you know that Hello World in other languages, like, for example, Java, is not quite as clean. You know, to, to print hello world, if you're an intro C, uh, CS student, you need to learn about classes, you need to learn about public methods of classes, and all, all this stuff just to do this. And this, this, is just, um, this, this is just a drop in the bucket of what you need to write you know, Java code or C++ code or some of these other lower level languages. So Python is very fast for developing. Another thing that Python gives you, which is really nice, are these high-level libraries to do some really interesting things. This is an example of, from the Seaborn library, where you load a data set, and then there's this pair plot function that allows you to examine that data set. That data set is actually a pandas data frame. So you can apply this, uh, this pair plot to any pandas data frame, and you get out a nice visualization of the relationships between the points. You know, I'm sure there are libraries in Java or C++ that would allow you to do this, but it's going to be a lot more boilerplate code to do this kind of thing. So Python, we like Python because it's fast, and it's fast because it's interpreted, because it's dynamically typed, because it's high level, and you can code quickly, you can try things out quickly, and you can, um, you can get, get the things from your mind into your script without much, uh, with, without much effort. But then, of course, on the other hand, right, Python is slow. So, um, and Python is especially slow for repeated execution of low-level tasks. So, for example, if we, if we write this silly function in Python right here, this is just a function that loops through n times and um, updates some variable with, uh, with a, couple, uh, a couple different operations and then returns the result. Uh, I'm going to be using here the, the timeit magic function, which is available in IPython and the IPython notebook that allows you to quickly get benchmarks of simple functions like this. So if we use the timeit and we call this func Python with, uh, for a, a loop of 10,000, we find that this um, executes in 1.69 milliseconds. Okay, So that may be fast, maybe slow, but let, let's look at something in comparison. If we instead implement this exact same function in Fortran, here we're going to use this Fortran magic that's also part of IPython, so I can write Fortran code in the IPython notebook. It automatically produces a Python function that's wrapped that Fortran code, and then we're going to time it. So this is, this is pretty awesome right here. If you haven't checked out IPython, you should, you should see all the stuff it can do. But if we time this, uh, this Fortran function, we find that it completes in 17.9 microseconds. So as a comparison, we have, we've seen that here that Python is about a factor of 100 slower than Fortran when you're starting to write loops and do little operations over and over. And this is uh, not a fluke. This is basically how it is whenever you're writing loops over data in Python. Right, so this is the problem. And the reason this is happening is because um, 
Python is a high-level, interpreted, dynamically typed language. So each time you do a Python operation, there's a little bit of overhead. There are things like type checking. You know, when you do A plus B, Python has to type, check the type of A, check the type of B, then find the right code to add, say, an integer to an integer, and then produce the result. There's also reference counting. You know, you have to, you have to augment the reference or, or de decrease the reference count for different variables as you, as you change the values of them. And all of these are, it's a small amount of overhead for a single operation, for a single line of code. But when you put this in a loop and you do this 10,000 or 100,000 or a million times, that overhead builds up and can become really significant. And that's basically the reason this Python loop is so much slower than the Fortran loop, a uh, factor of 100 in this case. So, so this is the paradox that we have to work with when we're, we're doing scientific or numerically intensive Python. What makes Python fast for development, this high level, um, this, this high level interpreted and, and dynamically typed aspects of the language, what makes it fast is exactly what makes it slow for code execution. So we have to, when we're using Python, it's, it's always good to keep that in mind. I should note here that there, there are some approaches that are becoming more mature, like PyPy, Numba, and other just-in-time compilations that might fix this in the future. But for the time being, uh, CPython is kind of the, the thing that most scientists are using. And I can chat with you later about that if you have more questions. So this is where NumPy comes in. NumPy is basically designed to help us get the best of both worlds. We want to have the, the fast code development time of Python, but we want to have the fast code execution time of a language like C or Fortran. And the, the way NumPy does this is it recognizes that the things that are slow are when you're looping over small operations and building up that little overhead of repeated, repeated operations in Python. So it takes those looped opera operations and pushes them down into compiled code so that they can be done quickly. So basically, the, in compiled code, the type check only has to happen one time for the entire loop of a, of a million repetitions. Right? So. Um, Again, that green, I'm sorry, I should have done better. So four, I want to today talk about four strategies for, for speeding up code with NumPy. Um, and basically, these strategies boil down to trying to get rid of loops in your code. So that's why the title of this talk is Losing Your Loops. You want to get rid of loops in Python and try as hard as you can to, to put that code into NumPy. So the first strategy I'll talk about is ufuncs. We'll, we'll talk about what those are. Second strategy is using aggregations. The third strategy is using broadcasting. And the fourth strategy is using slicing, masking, and fancy indexing. So all of these sound like jargony terms, but I promise you I'll, I'll dive in deep and let you know exactly what they all mean. And again, I want to emphasize the overall goal is to remove Python loops from your code. If you have a Python loop that's more than three or five uh, repetitions, your code is going to be slower than it, than it has to be. OK, so strategy number one, using, using ufuncs. What, what is a ufunc? A ufunc is short for a universal function. And this is basically a, a special type of function defined within the NumPy library that operates element-wise on arrays. OK, and let me, let me show you an example of this. If you're a, a Python programmer that doesn't use NumPy and you want to do element-wise operations on your arrays, this is probably the best way to do it. So here we have an array of uh, about eight values. And we want to add five to each of those values, right? So as a, as a good Python programmer, you break out your list comprehensions, and you do val plus five for val in a. And you get out this result, which is exactly what you wanted. Great. So this is great. This is, this is the Pythonic way to do it. The, the NumPy way to do this, which um, is, is a bit simpler, is to, um, if you import NumPy and you turn this list into an array, then what you can do is you can treat that array as just a number. And you say b equals a plus 5. And NumPy overloads that plus operator and actually produces this result element-wise. So when you add 5 to an array, it's like adding 5 to every value of the array. And notice what the difference here is we don't have any for val and a in the Python code here. In the, NumPy code, or sorry, in the NumPy code below, we're just that for loop is actually taking place in the internals of NumPy. 
And what's going on is it's pushing that for loop down into the compiled core of the NumPy code. And just to convince you that this is a, this is a good idea, if we, if we bump this up to about 100,000 values, and we do this in Python, we get about 7 milliseconds per loop. Doing the same thing in NumPy, doing A plus 5, gives us 82 microseconds per loop. So again, we have a, about a factor of 100 speed up by going to this compiled version of the operation. By taking away the loops in Python, we get to a, a faster version with NumPy. And also, I should point out that it's much more concise and easier to type, right? It's harder to get that wrong. It's harder to get A plus 5 wrong than this list comprehension. So it's really, it's really nice. And there are a ton of u funks that you could use that are built into NumPy. Basically, all the arithmetic, bitwise, and comparison operators in Python are overloaded for NumPy arrays to do this sort of universal function, this element by element operation. And there are a bunch of other ones, like uh, NumPy has uh, trigonometric functions, exponential family functions. Um, in the SciPy package, there are special functions if you want to do things like you know, Bessel functions and gamma functions and all these things that physicists and mathematicians worry about. They're all in there as u funks, so you can do them quickly over large arrays. So those are u funks. This, the, the next strategy I want to talk about is using NumPy's aggregations. So what is an aggregation? An aggregation is a function which summarizes the values of an array somehow. So good examples are minimum, maximum, the sum, the mean, the median, uh, these sorts of things. And NumPy has a bunch of these built in. And again, it's something that um, if you were to write it out raw in Python, you could write it with a for loop, right? You could loop over these arrays and do it yourself. But it's much faster to do these min and max and other aggregations in NumPy. So um, just as an example to show you again that NumPy beats Python in this, if we take here we have a, an, a, a list of 100,000 random values, and we're going to see how long it takes Python to get the minimum of those values. And here, you know, it's, it's about two milliseconds. <clears throat> if we do the same thing in NumPy, if we, if we take a, uh, if we convert this list to an array, and then time this c.min, that the, the min method of the array is NumPy's version of the, the min function in Python. And here we got 30.8 milliseconds. So this is, a, again, almost 100, 100 times speed up for using the NumPy code versus the Python code. And I want to emphasize again, the reason it's doing this is because when Python's min function goes through that list, every value it gets to, it has to ask, what's the type of this value? OK, I'm going to compare that type to the current minimum. What's the type of the next value? And all that overhead multiplied by 100,000 turns into this, um, this slowdown overall. So um, the, the other thing that NumPy's aggregations can do is it can work on multidimensional arrays. So um, if you want the sum of an entire array, you can just do m.sum and you get it out. If you want the sum of, say, all the columns in the array, you pass the sum an axis argument. And now instead of looping through the columns and asking for the sum of each one individually, that loop is pushed down into the compiled layer and you have a very fast sum of all rows. So sum axis equals 0 gives you the sum of the columns. Sum of axis equals 1 gives you the sum of all the rows. And you get those answers out quickly. And this, this works for a 3 by 5 array. It also works for a 1,000 by 10,000 array. And it's relatively quick. So there are a lot of aggregations available in NumPy, and you should get familiar with them if you're going to be doing so any large-scale data analysis. Um, minimum, maximum, sum, product, mean, standard deviation, variance. Uh, there are these Boolean ones, any or all, which are similar to the Python any or all functions, but faster for arrays. There's median, percentile, rank-based statistics. There are things like argmin and argmax that give you the index of the minimum and the index of the maximum value very quickly. And then for almost all of these, there are uh, nanmin and nanmax and nansum that do the same thing but ig ignore nans, which are the special floating point, uh, not a number marker. And the cool thing here is all of these have the same call signature, so you can pass axis commands to them, you can operate on multidimensional arrays, and all of them work very, very quickly. So that's the second strategy, aggregations. The, the third strategy that I want to go over is broadcasting. So this is something that's very cool in, in NumPy. What broadcasting does is it gives you a set of rules by which u-funks 
operate on arrays of different sizes and dimensions. So what these set of rules allow you to do is to do things like, for example, add a single digit to a uh, vector, like in that top row right there. We can add a row to a matrix, and it basically adds to every, it, it adds to every row along there. And we can do even crazier things, like we can take a column vector and add it to a row vector, and those are broadcast together to, to become a, a two-dimensional array. So these, the rules of broadcasting are, are pretty simple, sometimes a little bit confusing. It takes a while to wrap your mind around what's going on. But once you, once you get these down, there's a huge amount of, uh, of operations that you can do really efficiently with these broadcasting rules. So the first rule is if the array shapes differ, you left pad the smaller shape with ones. Then um, you compare the dimensions. And if any dimension doesn't match, you broadcast or uh, kind of expand the dimension that has size equals 1. And if the dimensions don't match, but neither of the dimensions is 1, there's no way to match those together, and you raise an error. So just as a quick example of, uh, of how this goes, if we look at this adding a scalar to a vector, basically, to, to start with, the shape is 3 and empty. You know, a scalar value is 0-dimensional, so it has no shape. Uh, we apply the first rule. And we left pad the smaller shape with ones. So that turns our, our, matrix, our vectors into a shape 3 and shape 1. When we apply the second rule, we, we broadcast that 1 up to a 3, which means we sort of like, we can think about copying the memory across into a length 3 vector. But we're not actually copying the memory. That's just an abstraction to think about. So there's no memory overhead in this. NumPy just acts as if that's happening under the hood. And now, after these two shapes uh, agree, so the final shape will be a length 3 vector, and we end up basically adding 5 to all those values. Uh, looking at the second one, it's very similar. We have a 3 by 3 matrix. We're adding to a length 3 vector. The first thing we do is left pad it with 1s to make the number of dimensions match. Then we broadcast that one up, and we stretch that vector across the whole matrix. And then we, we, have two, uh, we now have two matrices that match. We add them together, and we get out shape 3-3. Three, three. And then the more complicated case are things like this, where we have something that's a 3 by 1 array uh, added to a length 3 vector. And we just follow through. We, we pad the shapes so that they're the same number of dimensions. Then in this case, both, of the, uh, both the left-hand side and the right-hand side need to be broadcast to match the other. So we broadcast both of them. We add them together, and we end up with a 3 by 3 array. So what this allows you to do is things like, uh, rather than writing loops over one side and another to, to do like outer products and things like this of arrays, rather than writing these loops in Python, you can um, express them with this broadcasting syntax. And you get a much faster computation and also much cleaner code. You don't have to worry about loop indexes as you go through these things. So that was the third strategy. The fourth strategy I want to talk about is slicing, masking, and fancy indexing. So if you're used to, um, to lists in Python, you know that you can index lists with an integer to find a single value. You can index lists with a slice to find multiple values. But that's pretty much the extent of indexing in, um, in, for Python lists. Now, you can do the same thing with, with NumPy arrays. If we turn this, array, this list into an array, we can now take an integer index. We can ask for L0, and we get back the, that first element. We can ask for a, a slice of the array, and we get, get back another um, array that contains those elements. Uh, but NumPy actually offers a lot of other fast ways and convenient ways to do this sort of indexing and to index more complicated chunks of the array and chunks of data. And one of those is masking. And this is, this is actually really, really useful. If you take uh, an array of Boolean values, you can, index the, you can index an array with another array of Boolean values, and it treats it as a mask. So basically, here, the, the two lines up with the false. The three lines up with the true. The five lines up with the true. And only the values which line up with trues in that mask are returned by the indexing operation. 
So this might seem, you know, a little bit like, why, why would you need to do this? Where this becomes really useful is when you combine it with uh, some of the U-funks that we saw earlier. So for example, here we're going to create a mask where we're going to say we want all the places where L is less than 4, so the value in the list is less than 4, and then we use the bitwise or operator and we say we want places where it's less than 4 or uh, greater than 8. And we apply that mask and it returns all the values in the list that satisfy those criteria. So now instead of writing a loop over the list and saying, you know, for, for item in list, if item is less than four or item is greater than eight, append it to the result. This just happens automatically. It happens in a couple lines of code and it's much, much faster than the equivalent uh, Python by hand version. Another, another useful way of uh, accessing elements is fa fancy indexing. And fancy indexing is just basically passing a list or array of index in indices. So if we want the zeroth element, the fourth element, and the second element from the array, we just put those indices in a list, and we um, pass that list to the, to the array index, and we get out the values. And again, we don't have to write a, a loop over all these indices. We just pass them all at once. And it's much quicker than writing the Python loop. And finally, these, uh, these can all be combined for multi-dimensional multi arrays. So multi-dimensional arrays, you can access um, by row, comma, column, the indices, the, the data that you want. So if we pass 0, comma, 1, we're asking for the row 0 and column 1, and that is the value 1. We can go further and we can combine slices and indices. So here we're asking for all rows, the, the colon means an empty slice. We're asking for all rows, and we're asking for column number one. So we get one, four, which is that, that second column in the matrix. We can even do things like uh, masking on the, these multidimensional arrays. If we, here we're doing kind of a compound oper operation. We're saying m minus three, so that's a u-funk that applies element-wise. Taking the absolute value of that, another u-funk which applies element-wise. We're asking where that's less than two, so that returns a Boolean mask element-wise, telling us where that condition is met. And what we get out is an array of just the values that meet that condition, where m minus three absolute value is less than two. So all this happens under the hood in compiled code very, very quickly. And now it gets even, even more interesting. We can start doing things like combining fancy indexing and slicing. So here we're doing fancy indexing of the rows and slicing of the columns. And we get out the row number one followed by row number zero. And uh, we get the slice of the first two elements. So this happens very fast. And we can do things like mixing masking and slicing. So here what we're going to do is we're going to combine one of these aggregates. We're going to sum along axis equals 1. So we're summing along the rows. And we're asking where the sum of the row is greater than 4. And we're going to pass that as a mask. So that gives us one of the two rows. And then in those rows that are returned, we want um, elements starting at index 1 in the columns. So we get out 4, 5. Because that second row has a sum greater than 4 and we get those second two elements. So you can start to see by combining all these different things together, putting them in, and composing them and putting them together in different ways, you have uh, a nearly limitless number of operations, fundamental operations that you can do very, very quickly that scale very well to large arrays and large data sets. And you don't have to write a single Python loop the whole time as you're going over this data. So as a last little thing, I want to give an example of computing nearest neighbors. So imagine we have a bunch of points floating out there in space, and we want to compute for each of those points which is the nearest neighbor of that point. Now you could do it, um, basically the, what we're going to do is compute the Euclidean distance. So for each point, we need, each point i, we need to look at another point j. We need to take a difference of the x's, difference of the y's, square them. And then that'll give us the square distance between them, right? So the naive way to do this would be to do for i in range n, for j in range n, for k in range number of dimensions. So you have three loops, and then you do this thing, and you keep track of it, right? So it's, it starts to, to, be, to become a headache and keeping track of indices. And also, you have all these slow Python loops. But let's see if we can do this in uh, NumPy with putting together all these techniques that we've been talking about. 
So here, if you're used to scikit-learn or some of these other, um, other libraries, this is the way that we do multi-dimensional data. This is a thousand points in three dimensions. It's a thousand, thousand by three dimensional array. The first thing we'll do is we'll use broadcasting to get the differences between different pairs of dimensions. So we reshape this X array and subtract X from it. And if you follow the broadcasting rules, what comes out is a thousand by thousand by three array. So that says for point I and point J and dimension K, what's the difference between those dimensions? Now, of course, we want to um, aggregate this. We want to sum across those differences. So we square these differences and we take the sum along the second dimension. And that gives us a thousand by thousand matrix. And this thousand by thousand matrix uh, point or uh, Item ij in there is the distance, the squared distance between the ith point and the jth point. Right? We haven't written any loops yet, so this is great. Now we need to figure out which is the minimum. But the problem is every point is zero distance from itself. right? So let's uh, hack this a little bit. And we're going to set the diagonal of the matrix to infinity. So we can do this with fancy indexing. We want, we want point zero zero to be infinity. We want point one one to be infinity. And we go all the way through. And we can do that with this a range command. That's very strange. Um, and um, once we have that, we, we want to do a, um, an aggregation across this array. So we ask for not the minimum value, but the argmin. We want to know the index of the minimum value. And we get that out, and we get the index of the minimum value, which is the nearest neighbor of every point in this data set. And just to double check that we're doing the right thing, we um, can pull in scikit-learn nearest neighbors and just do the nearest neighbors thing there, and we get the same result out. So this shows you that we have, we have just done this huge operation that if you naively did it, it would take a lot of loops. But we did it with just a couple broadcasting and um, ufunk and, uh, and aggregation commands in NumPy. And it'll happen really, really fast. In fact, if you look at the nearest neighbor's code, the brute force algorithm in scikit-learn, this is essentially what it does under the hood. So uh, in a quick summary, I, I want to leave you with this. Writing Python is fast. Writing it and developing in Python is fast. But loops, in particular, can be really, really slow. So if you're looping over large data sets, the best thing to do is to use uh, the NumPy package and try to get rid of those loops by using some of these strategies, using the ufunks for element-wise operations, using aggregations to summarize parts of the array using broadcasting to, um, to combine arrays of different sizes, and then using slicing, masking, and fancy indexing to access parts of arrays very, very quickly. And I'm going to leave it at that. Um, if you're interested in these slides, you can go to my Twitter account, JakeVDP. And about half an hour ago, I tweeted a link to the slides on speaker deck, so you should be able to find them there. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. So I thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. We have just a minute or two for questions for Jake, if you want to go ahead and ask one. Any questions? I see somebody sneaking towards the microphone. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you. Great talk. Yeah. Um, I'm, so one of the things that I always get confused about, uh, so a number of your examples where you did the, uh, the, reduc the, the masked and the fancy indexing, combining oh, yeah. all these things together, the input started out as a, um, say, a two-dimensional array. Mm -hmm. uh, but then when you did the masking, you pulled out a strange subset of them, and then the result ended up being a one-dimensional yeah. array, right? And uh, so, I'm, so there's, a, there's a sense in which sometimes that's kind of counterintuitive. Uh, yeah, yeah. So in, in that situation, if, you know, if you're only pulling out a few values from a two-dimensional array, mm -hmm. there's no way to keep the dimensions unless you have some sort of sparse output, right? right. So if you're going to have a dense output, that, that's why it, it does just a single array out like that. Right. But you can do things like if, if your um, index mask is multidimensional, um, you can actually pull out, uh, you can pull out a result of, of multidimensions. The result will follow the shape of the index. So is the default rule that it'll, uh, I guess it, it's assuming like you're either doing row or column major based indexing, and it's just pulling those out in, uh, in whatever order it would be stored in memory? Um, it's, yeah, essentially that's, that's what it does. It, okay. it uses the, the internal storage of the matrix. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks. I think we have time for one more question. 
Are, are you going to be? And I'll, I'll stand around afterwards. Yeah, he'll, uh, yeah. We'll push him out the room, and he'll stand around afterwards. Uh, perhaps you can do an open space. Yeah. So this, is, this is, seems like a great way to shrink the time of your loops, but the loops are still there inside NumPy, correct? So if you have a high algorithmic complexity, it'll still come out in the end? Right, absolutely. So if you have an n squared algorithm, you're still doing n squared evaluations, but those are happening in the compiled layer. Fat, so you don't faster. get the overhead of the Python type checking. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming to the talk.